I thank you all for those excellent expressions in prayer. It's like going to school, listening to your prayers. I really appreciate it. And we're we're in the first chapter of Ephesians tonight. We're going to be in the 18th verse. Contemporary Christianity, for the most part, and understand I don't delight in saying things like this, but I feel as though they have to be said. For the most part, it considers conversion or becoming a Christian the primary thing. You'll be hard-pressed to find any place where this isn't the perception. And this is driven by a, a primary misconception of the work of the Lord, it, that the work of the church is winning souls, even though that term is never used in reference to conversion in Scripture. I know someone will say, what about Solomon? He said, he that winneth souls is wise. He wasn't even talking about the knowledge of God there. He was talking about human influence. Before you can influence somebody else to see what you, you've got to... Be wise. Well, there is this application in the spiritual realm, but that is not what Solomon was talking about. And so having adopted this stance that conversion is the main thing, and they've developed all kind of talk to make this sound really good, but it hasn't produced good results at all. With this in mind, once a person is converted, they're pretty much abandoned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't think that's the case, well, think again. All that person has to be is honest. Mm -hmm. You don't have to cook anything up here. Yeah. Most all of you have had to overcome ignorance that was gained while you were in church. Yeah. I had, and I was in some. Of, I sat under some pretty good preaching. But I'll tell you there, it's a pitiful situation. And this text is all about that kind of thing. It's all about it. There has been a deliberate covering up of Christ's words, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. I don't know why that's not called the Great Commission. If someone could really explain that to me, I'd be really happy. If someone could explain to me why that isn't the Great Commission. And then, of course, Paul said, feed the flock of God over which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. And Peter said, feed the house of God. Feed it. Nourish it. Why? Because in the kingdom of God, growth isn't automatic. Growth just like doesn't happen. The things that growth automatically happens, we call them weeds and wild plants. And if you really want the good food, you don't eat the wild one with the wild stuff. It, you can live on it all right, but <laughs> it's not quite like something that's been cultured and cultivated. Even God, when he, he built a vineyard, he prepared the ground for the vineyard and he prepared for the vineyard to be maintained and so forth. Now Christ has purposely given a job to the church. He said what it is, that there's no ambiguity about it all. It's in this book of Ephesians. We'll, we'll, we'll cover it, I don't know when we get to it. But he said that the purpose of all the gifts God gave the church, including evangelists, Ephesians 4, 11, inclu I say including evangelists, is to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry and edifying the body of Christ, is to make sure there are no more children, is to make sure they grow up into him, Christ, in all things. 
and that the whole body is fitly framed together. It doesn't have two parts, the part on the stage and the part in the pew. That's not the way God set it up. Each person is integrated with the other person. And the point isn't that we're just together. It's that something happens when we're together. Amen. There's a flow from Christ ahead through the members to one another. Yeah. I mean, you may have 30 or 40 people connecting with you in the assembly, things flowing into you. You may be connected to 30 or 40 people from whole things flowing out of you, see? I told that's what that's what the church is for. That's what that's why he has a body. Why do you have a body? You don't have a body so from a paralyzed from the neck down. What kind of body is that? We say well, they're quadriplegic. You know they they can't do anything. Well, a lot of churches are dead from the neck down. They don't really have anything. Amen. Paul's writing to avoid that circumstance. He's writing. Right he knows that more is involved than just saying that. You got to say it. But he's praying about this. Then he tell the people what he prayed for. I'd be interested what would happen if all preachers would tell the people what they prayed for. That'd be, that'd be. <laughs> you can think about yourself. Well, wouldn't that be an enlightening thing? You might really be blessed by it. Then again, you might not. By way of comparison, now observe how Paul talks to the Ephesians. They're, they have not only been converted, they're like premier converts. The word has got out, outside the circumference of their fellowship. The word's got out that they have faith in Christ and love all the saints. Uh, how, many, <laughs> how many groups exactly do you know of like that? Maybe you know individuals, but what about a body of believers? How, like, how many do you know? I know hundreds of churches. Maybe it's in the thousands that I have had personal contact with over the years. I could count on this hand right here. The ones that are noted outside their city for having faith in Christ and love of the saints. And the rest of them, even across town, someone hasn't heard about them. These are the kind of people we're talking about here now. He's heard about people that are they're famous. Among believers, they're famous. For what they do and now but he knows they may be famous but they're not yet they're not there yet they haven't grown up to full grown people yet see the condition uh, this it's hard for me to talk about this because it's, it breaks my heart I stay awake at night dominated by this thought there's a lot of people who are sincere, but they're sincere dummies. They're like a real naive little child. They can get hurt because they don't understand. Yes. They can be led astray because they don't comprehend. Some strange, some theological stranger can pick them up like a stranger can pick your kids up and feed them a lot of malarkey. This is a tremendous burden that I carry. Sometimes I have to just tell it because it kind of relieves me of it. This is why I write. It's why I use every media that I can to at least say what I know. I don't know everything, but what I know I aim to tell. I promised God I'd do it. I'll tell it. If you can show it to me, I'll tell it. And I, That's what drives me to do this so people won't be at such a tremendous handicap living for Christ. Now he's going to inform them... <laughs> I'm praying for you. Not just to thank God for them. He thanked God for them. He told them that. Because, why? Because they were the work of God. That's why you thank God for believers. It's because they're the work of God. But he told them he's going to pray something in particular for them. His prayers raised to God because he knows what spiritual life is all about. He knows what it takes to get from earth to heaven. It's not simplistic. You, nobody's going to stumble into heaven. <laughs> so he knows what's involved here. So he goes to the throne of God about it. Now it's verse 18 reads this way. He's already told me he bowed his knees to the Father. He prayed for them always that they would be given the spirit 
they would be given the spirit of wisdom and knowledge the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him now he's going to break that down tell you what that's involved the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye might know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You might say, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? The eyes of your understanding. Merit's looking into the eyes, not of the eyes of your feeling. <laughs> Not the, not the eyes of your casual passive thinking, the eyes of your understanding. Means you can't understand what you don't see. In the kingdom of God, seeing takes a priority. It's absolutely foremost in the kingdom of God to see or perceive or comprehend or discern it takes priority the kingdom of God in the real kingdom of God some other versions read the eyes of your heart the eyes of your mind your hearts and the eyes of your thought well what that is telling you is that this is quite a weighty expression it's not all that easy to, to translate The eyes, a number of versions leave that out. They don't use eyes. They don't have it in there at all. But it is in the text. The word is ophthalmo ophthalmois, which we get ophthalmology from, which is a study of the eyes. So it, the term eye is in the text. Eyes is in the text. The eye is, a, in, the, in the definitive sense, dictionary sense, is a bodily organ for seeing. In the literal sense, it refers to the organ by which the environment and what's in it is perceived. That's what the eye is for. You know how it affects you if you can't see what's around you. Yeah. Just <laughs> you got to have someone lead you. Or you have to be very familiar with the, yeah, right. with the territory. All right, now he's talking about not the eyes of the bodily eyes, but the eyes of your understanding. Or right. well, some versions read the heart. And there's a dispute about the, the Greek text and all this sort of thing that isn't profitable to get into. But the idea here is that it has to do with the spiritual faculty that enables us to see spiritual realities that can't be perceived by the senses. You can't see it with this eye, you can't hear it with your ear. There's a spiritual ability called the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your heart that God gives you. See, he gives the seeing eye he gives. When Moses talked to Israel, he said, well, God hadn't given you eyes to see. They didn't really see what was happening at Sinai. Moses did. And he said, show me thy glory. <laughs> he, see, he saw what was happening. The Israelites, they don't talk anymore. They didn't see what was happening. So Paul didn't assume they have these. He didn't say... You're making a lot of good progress. You have faith in Christ. I'm just going to let things go because things are on a roll or moving right along. That's not what he says. Because he knows we don't live in a vacuum. We've got an adversary that's stalking us, seeking whom we may devour. We've got principalities and powers that are grappling with us, trying to take us down. You've got an old man inside of you. You've got the body that's against us. It's a complicating affair that we've got. The eye or eyes are mentioned 57 times in the Gospels. 57 times Jesus talks about the eye or eyes. Interesting. By nature, 
the eyes it's talking about are closed, like a baby kitten's eyes. When a person's born again, their eyes are really closed. They have to be opened. Now the little kitten knows enough, he can make his way to his mother. Because the mother makes sure she's near enough, the kitten can sense it. It's the same as a person who's born again. God makes sure he's close enough so that even though the knowledge that the newborn has, newborn baby has, is sparse, they can sense the presence of the one who's going to nourish him. See, just like just is projected in the animal world. It's like a spiritual instinct. And they can also sense when nothing's there that can nourish them. Some of them crawl out. Well, it's amazing how much noise a little kitten can make when it can't find its mother. See, someone who's born again, they make noise like that. Call in on the name of the Lord for help. The eyes of your understanding. And most of the versions, modern versions say heart. The idea is the, the main part of you. Your understanding is one of your main abilities. And unless you've been deprived of a mental aptitude, which some people have, you've got this. You've got a capacity to understand. And if you can't understand anything, you can understand God. Yeah, yeah, the fact you can understand anything, you can memorize all the betting averages for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me you can't know a whole lot more about God than you know. Amen. Amen. You've got that capacity. But that capacity has to be sanctified or your eyes have to be opened or as our text says, the eyes have to be enlightened. That's the way God made it. See, God made you in Christ, so you have to depend on Him. Amen. God hasn't made provision for Him to be absent from the process. You're dependent upon Him. That's why people think that getting in is the main thing and everything just goes, oh, this isn't it at all. Because salvation depends upon God from start to finish. It needs Jesus from start to finish. It has to have the work of the Holy Spirit from start to finish. You've got to be able to see all the way home or you'll get sidetracked. And you want... <coughs> Paul goes on to say this. Why? Why is he doing this? Because he knows salvation is a complex thing. I want to just make some observations about things that had to be addressed in salvation. You know these things, but just to hear them like all at once, it's a kind of <laughs> kind of startling. That God must act in saving people in such a way as to demonstrate his wisdom without violating any other part of his nature. That's right. mm -hmm. Now you have a hard time doing things like this. You, you, you tell me this isn't the truth. Mm -hmm. See, sin has introduced this complex situation. God can't compromise his nature. As much as he loves people, as much as he wants to save them, he cannot compromise his nature. He can't violate some aspect of his nature in order to save somebody. Right. If he hates sin and workers of iniquity, which he says he does, he can't like forget that to save somebody. Amen. Now a savior must be found that can not only extricate people from the dilemma of sin, pull, pull them out, he's got to be able to keep them out. And keeping out is a, large, a lot harder than getting out. Right. Remember how Israel came out of Egypt in one night. After 40 years, over half a million of them never did get into the promised land. See, it's harder to keep out than to, than to get out. I don't think a lot of people know this. If you just just take a moment and think about it, I mean, you can see it. It's really, it's really obvious that Jesus' intercessory work is, is an ongoing work. His dying was one time, one act of obedience. 
That's what it took to take away sin. Just one act of obedience. One act yeah. of obedience, but he ever lives yeah. to make intercession. So that tells you keeping yeah. saved, if I may yeah. use that term, is harder than getting saved. Yeah. Yeah. That means the more work's got to be put in on that. Yeah. I mean, who can't see this? Is this really that hard to see? If God spends more time with the saved then why does the church spend less time with them? Can somebody explain that? Does somebody put that in words? If they do, I'll tell you right up front, I won't listen to it. This salvation requires a full-time work of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the angels. That's what kind of thing salvation is. Yes. At any point in time, the Holy Spirit would ever leave you, and you would not no, be able no. to, 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 to rightly divide the word. You wouldn't be able to make it. It's like me leaving here and getting halfway home and deciding, I can close my eyes for the rest of the trip. Yeah. You can't even keep the desire. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Amen. Now, here's something else that has to be done. Salvation has to do this. Salvation has to neutralize the power of the yeah. devil. The people have to be made adequate to resist the advances of the devil who yeah. person to person is infinitely stronger than they are. Yeah, right. It's he that's in you that's greater than he's in the world. Not you. You're not greater than Satan. You can't survive a hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil. He'll yeah. take you down every time. Right. Yet to resist him. Yeah. Right, salvation has to be able to make the people able mm -hmm. to resist uh, salvation has to provide an escape route in every single temptation, no matter how little, how big, how frequent, how infrequent. Every temptation has to come with a custom-made way of escape that is accessible to the person who believes. So salvation has to provide that. Provision must be made that when a man uh, to recreate man. That per salvation has to make a way to recreate man. Because what was in Adam has been written off. What Adam is not salvageable. Mm -hmm. Written off. There's a new lineage now and you've got salvation. It's to make a way for you to have a new lineage. <laughs> yeah, this is impossible in the flesh. It, it can't be done. But this, this has to be done in salvation. Salvation has to make a way to keep you from falling. Yeah. Salvation has to make a way to make you stand. Yeah. These are all texts from Scripture you'll recognize. Salvation has to make a way for mercy to be exhibited without negating wrath. Re because mercy is shown, wrath isn't erased. Uh -huh. Would to God everybody knew this. Yeah. A means must be made for mercy and truth to meet each other and righteousness and peace to kiss each other. Mercy says, save them, save them. Righteousness says there's none worthy. God's heart wants to be at peace with people. The truth of the matter is they were alienated. All right, salvation is to make a way for these attributes all to be reconciled. A way must be made to for man to pass the in-depth scrutiny of God who sees everything. Now whatever salvation does, it's got to make you so on the day of judgment you pass under the all scrutinizing eye of God, you pass. Amen. Salvation's got to accomplish that. And it's got to enable you to be conformed by a series of changes to the image of God's Son. Salvation got to accomplish that. There must be a righteous means for mortality to put on immortality. That's a pretty big assignment just right there. And there must be a righteous means for death to be swallowed up by life. Salvation's got to address all these, all these things. And men must be made righteous without God being unrighteous in doing so. Uh, those are just some things off the top of my head. Salvation, see, it's, big, it's a big thing. It's a big thing. So knowing this, Paul prays that your eyes would be enlightened. 
that your eyes may be enlightened. <laughs> you think that the environment may be enlightened. That's how, you, that's how we would say it. No, the eyes may be enlightened. He's not going to change the environment unless it's the heavenly places. That, that is true to change that. The capacity to see, the capacity to see is of no value unless there's illumination. What you're looking at has got to be plain. Otherwise, it doesn't make any difference if you can see or not. I mean, these eyes of mine, they're not, they're not too good, but I can make out the outline of things, but there's got to, I got to be in the environment of light for, the, for these eyes to function. You put me in, to, in one of these caves up here in north of, north of Joplin, stick me in one of the recesses of those caves and turn the lights out, it doesn't make any difference how you may have 20-20 vision, so what? It isn't going to work because the environment is dark. That's right. Amen. Now in this case, he enlightens the eyes. Mm -hmm. Now this is like a very clumsy illustration, but it's like your, light, your eyes are like powerful flashlights. <laughs> Wherever you look. Uh -huh. It's your eyes that are enlightened. Right. What you're able to see because what you look at becomes... Oh, you got to see this. Because what you look at, because of what God's done in you, is illuminated by your look. That's how God sheds light on it. He gives you the capacity to illuminate what you, whatever you're lo looking at. Actually, the power's not in you. The power's in God. The eyes, the vehicle he uses. He enlightens your eyes. Yes. Would it, would it be appropriate to what you're saying there? Like a, a spectrum. We know that, that God is light and that spiritual realities exist whether we perceive them or not. They yeah, exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, right. kind of like uh, different animals are sensitive to different spectrums of light. Yeah, For example, that's good. Bee, mm -hmm. They, they see more in the ultraviolet. So things that don't appear to us, when they're looking at it, they yeah. see something different. That's good. So mm -hmm. that the yeah. spiritual things that, that God has, it's like he makes us capable of perceiving That's good. Mm -hmm. That's better said than I said it. That's good. He gives you the kind of eye that's adapted to this. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. Oh, thank God. See, if you can see anything, yeah. give God the glory. Amen. He Amen. gave, yeah, right. He enabled you to see, He enlightened your eyes yeah. of your understanding. That's, you say, well, it's, I don't see very much. You don't see very much. You saw nothing before. Yeah. So anything you see is really a lot if you look at Amen. it right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> But some of the things you see now, don't you remember back when you, you know you didn't see it and right. you never even had any idea anything like this existed. Now all of a sudden you're, you not only see it, you're rejoicing in it, you take advantage of it. Why? The eyes of your understanding were enlightened. Yeah. And it's evidence to you that the Lord is working in you. That's right. And then when you're with the body and someone else has seen the same thing, everybody yeah. rejoices. Amen. Yes, amen. Now you see why Paul's praying this prayer here? He isn't saying, I'm going to make an annual visit there to make sure that I get this thing caught up. He could just write this, which is, he's depending on the things he's writing. He's depending on the enlightenment of the eyes so the people can read it and they'll see what he's talking about. Now, don't you know that this kind of prayer is still needed today? Could you think of... Who knows, estimate the number of church members that the Bible makes no sense to them at all? You can pray this prayer. Yeah. yeah, it is if you're close enough to God to see the issues. Pray this prayer that God would enlighten the eyes of their understanding so they can perceive what God's really put there in Christ, what's observable if you have the right, if you have the right capacity, you can see it, yeah. but God has to do it. There's a phenomenal percentage of professed Christian teaching that actually obscures God's truth. There's something being preached that God's never going to enable people to see it.
They're going to have a repeat. Have to have a repeat seminar every six months because God's not in the thing. He's not. They're saying something that God's not illuminating. That's why they have to update their books. That's why they have to do it. They have to have a revised. That's why. But when God enlightens a thing, you don't have to update the book of Romans or the book of Ephesians. Or you don't have to update what God's revealed. We're the ones that need the update. And that's what this is. This is God updating the believer. That's right. So people try to make the Bible simple to read. They're off on a wrong foot to begin with. They're off on a wrong foot. A good, uh, if someone really wants the people to understand, they need to pray. You gotta give them eyes of understanding. Yeah. You know, even even in the even in the working world, the um, we have an engineering handbook, and <laughs> it's been revised over years, but only for. I mean, the words haven't changed. Yeah. The engineering yeah. hasn't yeah. changed, and it's just as hard to read now as it was 50 years ago. Yeah. But nobody's dumbed that book down. Amen. The world knows you don't do that. You'll dumb it down yeah. there you go. so that common people can try to understand engineering. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. But, but we do that. Amen. Not we, but I mean, that's That's the humanity, yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't want people building the car that... <laughs> <laughs> that had the dumbed-down version. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That's a good point. Yeah. Any 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 proper revision, it kind of is telling you where to where to look. Uh -huh. In other words, the, but the basic principles they don't they're unchangeable. I have the same analogy there. If, if, if your heart surgeon he did the he did the the surgery for dummies, you know. I mean, would you put your life in their hand? Is the question. No. Would you say, well, I I trust you anyway, just because you know you wear a nice white coat. You can go ahead and cut me open. See, nobody would trust that person. I know. Nobody would. And yet people are putting their souls in their in the hands of people who they don't even know God, but they're just barking out something. Can we go say something here? Yes. The, the idea is not to bring the, the truth to a level where a more simple-minded person can understand it, mm -hmm. but to bring the simple-minded person That's it. up to a higher level That's it. where at least they were, their interest needs to be piqued. Even if they don't completely understand something, uh -huh. they need to yeah. sit and say, God, I don't understand uh -huh. this. Help me understand that. I was just reading through John 6 the, uh, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and I know, just noticed this, how to prove their hearts and where they were, Jesus' language keeps getting more confusing and it's more confusing right. Right. and more confusing. <laughs> right. Right. Until by the end, there's only 12 people. Yeah, that's, that's, right. Right. that's right. That's right. And, those, and the 12, you know, they don't understand it either, but they were willing there was no alternative, Jesus. was there? Who, oh, yeah. who, 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 who were we going to go? Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, we don't understand this, but you have we have no. We know here. that we know that we're starting from the vantage point of this is true, even if we don't understand it. We know that it will be revealed. To us. That's right. Yeah. See what that is. Now you step within the circumference where God works. When a person has this deep desire. I mean, he may be a spiritual simpleton, but if he has this desire to know, he stays within the circumference. He's where his eyes can be enlightened. That's right. See, in other words, the Ephesians, they were in a position where Paul could pray this. There were, there were things to be seen that would make them more stable. It doesn't mean they were vacillating. But, it, but their journey's not complete, and you have to be made stable. You'll start vacillating up here someplace when you face a complex trial. It's confusing. If, you don't, if you're not anchored, it'll, it'll confuse you too much, see? So he prays for their eyes of understanding. Yeah? I was thinking of this text in 2 Timothy 2, 5, while you're going through this. It says, if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not ground except he strive lawfully. Lawfully. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've ever... Ever, ever seen somebody that's a master of something, they make it look real easy. <laughs> that's, right. that's the thing that I look for in a musician. When I see a musician play, mm -hmm. 
it, when it when it's hard for them, now I know they're not they're not a master. Every getter, yeah. They, it's <laughs> easy to them. In fact, it sometimes can appear yeah. so easy to them. It seems like you could take up the instrument and just do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. And but then, if you were to ask him, he wouldn't say it's easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then when you get to right? talking with him, you, <laughs> you would find, ask him. <laughs> like I, I uh, yeah. When I was working in a music store, we had a drum clinic. Had a guy come in, and he made it look really just all kinds of stuff that he did. And then I got to talk with him. Fifteen hours a day of practice. Mm -hmm and specific schooling with certain people who have been experts in this field over the years who have mastered the technique of how to get yeah. to become a master of this. Yeah. And so that's kind of how it is in the life of faith. You can't just step into it and drink, beat the drum and think it's going to work. It doesn't work that way. Although the person you're looking at, it may look like it's easy to them, but it's not. Mm -hmm. You have to understand what's behind that. And that's what the spirit of wisdom and knowledge is about, Amen. is helping you to understand so the finer details. Back behind that, the master in this case is God. That's right. He's the master. Everybody else is an un, every other teacher is an under teacher. That's right. They're not the primary teacher, they're the secondary teacher. The main teacher is Christ, but he only teaches certain people. That's right. The under teacher, his job is get the people inside the, the teaching circle. And how do you do that? You, you do that by talking about the foundational things, not what people, what they ought to do. Now, now we're going to get into this here. Yes. You know, everyone probably had this experience, but I can remember in confronting someone and thinking I had an understanding of it, and I would find myself, because you taught on it, or somebody had taught on it, and I, I picked up enough to where I thought I, I had pretty good control of this, <laughs> But in the middle of the conversation, I realized I didn't have <laughs> yeah. as much understanding as the teacher did. And so even though I could lead a person this far, really, that's a, I couldn't, I, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't understand it, but I wouldn't have never known that had I not yeah. talked about it, had yeah. I not thought about it some more. And then yeah. I realized that, you know, growing in this thing requires these eyes. Well, amen. Well, I know Toby encountered this, some of your teachers finally, you, they couldn't teach you anymore. Uh -huh. That mean you could. That didn't mean you couldn't be taught anymore. Uh -huh. It just meant they couldn't teach you anymore. Well, that's the same way it is. There come a time when Paul had to teach, but he had to teach in order that the master teacher Amen. could get involved. Now, notice what he's going to pray: their eyes be enlightened to. It's not to their human responsibility. May the Lord enlighten you as to how you ought to live what kind of family member you should be. This is not the subject of enlightenment now. That you might know what is the hope of his yes. calling. Remember he said that he would give you the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, in, wis, give you the spirit of wisdom in the knowledge of him. Uh -huh. All right, so that's the... That's that's the thing he's talking is understanding him. Understand the hope of his calling. You've got the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. Now in his light, we see light. As in Psalms 36, 9. That is, there are some lesser lights that you can't see unless you're in the greater light. So he's going to seek to get them in the greater, greater light. There's a phenomenal amount of professed Christians, Christian teaching, that actually obscures God's truth. You simply are not left thinking about God. This is not what you're left thinking about. You're not thinking about me. Now, there are times when that's necessary, I know, but Paul's not talking about a crisis kind of situation. He's talking about a bedrock foundational thing that all saints have to come to the point where they understand God, where the ways of God are perceptible and make sense, where they can say, that's not like God. Or, ah, that's like God to do that. They've got to come to that point, and you can't, you can't do this in a classroom. 
God is the one who does this. Now he starts out with a, that you may know this is not know like you know the alphabet or mathematical tables. This is more like you know how to swim. That's the kind of that, the clumsy parallel. What is that? You can use it, in other words. You can employ it. Now, if, if an individual or a collective church is to live before God successfully, there are some things that must be known. You've got to be able to traffic in this. You've got to be able to handle this knowledge like you handle coins. You have to know what, what, what to use, how to use it. It's marvelous. The hope of his calling. Why, why, why did God call you anyway? Notice how he starts. He doesn't start that you might know how you got in or that you might know why you were obedient or that you might know what happened when you were baptized or whatever. There are things that you need to know about that, but he starts at the foundation that you might know the hope why God called you. Why did he call you? And the, the saints are called the called. It's he initiated. He initiated the called. We're admonished to consider your calling. Many are called, but few are chosen. This is not men calling on the name of the Lord. It's God calling men. Why did he do it? Why did he call the 12 disciples? Why did he call the 70? Why, why, did he, why did he call you? Why? You've got to know why. It wasn't just to get you out of a dilemma. He had a higher purpose than that. When we were begotten by God, it was in order to have a living hope. You might know the hope of his calling. See? It isn't that God is hoping. <laughs> it is... There's the idea. The idea is he's begotten you, this is First Peter, he's begotten you to a living hope. In other words, you've been born again so you can hope for what God has purposed. Amen. See, that's, that's how you got to want and look forward to what God has promised. That's something you don't have yet, <laughs> but you're going to. Hope of his calling. This hope is called a blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. All right, from one point of view, the hope is for you to be ready when Jesus comes. Then when Jesus comes, you'll be able to walk right in. And the door will be shut. Huh? You'll not have to make some last minute arrangements because you won't have time. I get the picture in Scripture from some of his parables and so forth that the coming of Christ will be attended by some, some kind of phenomenon that people will know what's happening, but they're not going to be able to do anything about it. Now's the time to do something about it. See, now's the time to do it. This is the time to get ready. God has a hope for you. See, he's going to, he's going to give the church as a bride to Christ, and Christ is not going to marry, excuse the harsh language, a whore. Right. Amen. Do you expect him to? Do you expect him to marry someone who's a friend of the world? He's not going to do it. But once you know this in your mind, you begin to stand aloof from the world, see? Once you see this, you begin to cleanse yourself of all filthiness of flesh and spirit and perfect holiness of the fear of God. Why? Because you know the hope, the hope I have is of being presented without spot or wrinkle or any such things. I'm going to work on it right now. But see, you have to see this. If you think that, that God called you just because he loved you, quote, so much, whatever that means, no, God had a bigger, he did love you, but he has a bigger thing on the agenda than that. From one point of view, <coughs> this is why you're being changed. You're being adapted to the environment of glory. you, you got to be able to fit in there. Now, when people go to heaven, they have to be able to fit in. 
The rich man, he did he didn't fit in. He went to hell. He didn't fit in where Lazarus was going. Lazarus, he fit in. He got nestled right up in the bosom of Abraham. <laughs> he fit in, see? Why? Because he was living under God here with a lot of handicaps. So God changes us from glory to glory. And how does he do this? Second Corinthians 3.18 says, it's while we behold the glory. It's the glory of Christ. While we behold the glory, and this is the one who's in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. The glorified Christ is in heaven. So while you're beholding him, you're changed in stages to be like him. So that when the time comes that you exit your body, and that time's going to come, you'll just be able to just feel right at home. And everyone who is surprised <coughs> when they stand in the presence of God, they're not going to stay. That's the purpose of salvation. That's knowing the hope of his God. you got to be able to, it's that you stand up. At last you stand tall right in the presence of God with boldness in the day of judgment. That's the purpose, see? That's the purpose. That's why he called you. Everybody's going to appear. But uh, everybody's not going to feel pleasant. So you be in the, the hope of his calling, your eyes of your understanding be enlightened so you can know why God called you and how this thing is going to end up and don't get caught up in living in the world. Amen. Don't You've got to live here. I understand that. You, these are nece there's necessary things that have to be done. But don't get absorbed with them. Don't let them dominate you because this world is at war with heaven. Yes, it's going to pass away. You've been called to eternal life and it's, that's different from what's in the world. Yes. That's not all. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened so you know the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Not the inheritance of the saints. That's not. Some versions translate it this way, but it's not right. His glorious inheritance among the saints. Yeah, that's, that's weak. That is weak. His holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. That's a new living translation. That's good. That's good. God has been made rich because we who are in Christ have been given to him. That's a living Bible. But that's good. That's good. We're the inheritance. It's not the inheritance he's given us. We are the inheritance. Now the doctrine declares this. It tells us, for instance, that we've been reconciled unto God. Why? We're his inheritance. <laughs> God is re God's in Christ reconciled in the world to himself. Huh? Salvation's what you got. You're what God got. And in the end, it's going to be good. <laughs> God's going to be pleased now what he gets. That's, yes. That's a good thing to think about because we think about, I, I was thinking, that seems kind of unfair and we get the better deal, but he's really going to get a good deal. He's not going to get, so see, that's why. got to think about that. That's why it's a vast number that no man can remember. Right. If it was just one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, <laughs> yeah. well, yeah, we could say it's a small thing, but this is going to be a vast multitude yeah. no man can number. Yeah. And they're all going to be like him. Yeah. One concept: If you were the only one, yeah, was, uh, such yeah. a silly thing. That's right. Yeah. It's just see they say that to pacify the pacify the people because they know most of the people aren't serious. That's why they say stuff like this. <laughs> Let's look at more some more at this. It's the firm we've been reconciled to God by the death of His Son. God has adopted us by Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 5, unto himself. See, there you are. There's the inheritance. We're his inheritance. God has adopted us, Jesus Christ, by him, unto himself. We are said to have been redeemed unto God and are the first fruits unto God. See? <laughs> now, you've got to see this. 
because under any other economy than that which is in Christ Jesus, people have universally been afraid to come to God. They were afraid, Adam was afraid. Israel was afraid at Sinai. Man's afraid to come to God, but all of a sudden, here's a purpose put into place that makes the people God's inheritors, and they're going to be called his jewels. They're going to be called a royal diadem in the hand of the Lord. They're what he, he's going to do this. And here, this is why he invested so much of himself. This is why Jesus poured out his soul unto death. It was in the prospect of this inheritance, the riches of the glory. In other words, God's going to get a lot of glory when they're, when they're redeemed by the Lord or perceived together. God's going to get a lot of more glory than he ever has had before, so far as we know. That's right. And Jesus is bringing us to God, right? Second Peter three eighteen. See, it's every place in the Bible. It's every place bringing us to God. God will personally take up His abode with the saints. God Himself shall dwell with them. See, now He does it by representative. Now He dwells in us by the Spirit. It's a, there's another. There's a go between. He does it as Christ is in you, the hope of glory, but. Then he himself, That's right. he's going to take his inheritance. Amen. He's going to set up shop, so to speak, in the middle of his inheritance. I believe that it's hard for us now, perhaps, to comprehend the vastness of the, the personality of God. And yet, each when each member, when it's together, and you see each member holds a unique portion of the Godhead, yeah. And, in, and, and the representation as the vast number comes together and God will be able to move into that without anything missing from That's the right. representation right. it's like a crown That's see? Right. It, it's not like a ring the church isn't like a ring uh -huh. it's, it's like a crown That's right. which is what a royal diadem is once this is seen and understood well, there's a lot of things that make sense Christ gave himself for us that we might live, Christ died for us that we might live unto him who died for us and rose again. Why? Because that's where God's inheritance. That's why. They'll not live for themselves, but for him. They'll count it all joy when they fall into diverse temptations. When they're called upon to suffer for Jesus, they'll count it all joy. Thank God. Because in the kingdom of God, suffering always is followed by glory. Yes. Amen. So if you've been counted worthy, let's say that you're among those who because of your faith you suffered a lot. That's got to mean God's reserved a lot for you. Right. You've got to really think this thing, you got to think holy backwards yes. in a holy sense. If I'm suffering a lot, then that's got to mean it is a big inheritance over there. And he suited me. He's called making me meet for the yeah, inheritance. Amen. <laughs> that's why they were that's why they counted it all joy. Isn't it felt good to be beaten? I mean, that's not why. <laughs> if you know this, you'll be steadfast and unmovable. Yes. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh -huh. You'll reason this way, you'll say, you know, if I'm gonna be among those presented unto God. I want to be clean and pure and holy. I don't want to defile myself. Uh -huh. Instead of those who are with Jesus, they did not defile themselves with women. That was a way of saying they were, they were pure and holy, devoted to Christ. So whatever you do in word or deed, you do all for his glory. Why? Because this is how you, you ought to live? Well, yeah, this is how you ought to live. Yeah, we admit that. But it's in the prospect of this in the riches of the glory of the, his inheritance in the saints. It's, it's thinking about that that will prompt you to be consistent in your efforts. Otherwise, you'll have ebb and flow. You'll be, you'll be on and off and in and out. I mean, that's just, just how people are. Mm -hmm. But once this is fixed in your mind, why God called you, and that you are part of God's own inheritance, you, you're thankful to God for what he's done already, 
and you say, I'm going to present my body a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, which is my reasonable service. God hasn't asked anything unreasonable. And then when the glory comes, <laughs> oh, you'll be glad you did. No one's going to be thinking, oh, I wasted a lot of my life. I could have really been somebody. Because after death, everybody on their own is going to be a nobody. <laughs> there could be distinctions in the flesh. See, after you're out of the body, Donald Trump and Bill Gates are going to be on the same level as a pauper. They're all going to be on the same level. This is how we are by nature. We're all on the same level, and when the flesh is done away, we're all on the same level. Some of those people are going to be prepared yes, to be jewels yes, in, the, in Christ, in God's crown, and be his inheritance. Paul said, now I want, I'm praying you'll be able to see this. If you can just see this, <laughs> it'll do what a thousand words of exhortation might do. It'll do. It, you see how God moves you forward? This is how he does it. He holds out. He told you. But by the exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be made partakers of the divine nature. That's the same thing I've been saying. So God tells you what you're going to be. If you step out of line, he will not. He'll tell you what you ought to be. He will. But you've got to get out of the ought to be and get in the would be. <laughs> and when you do, uh, just the thought. Just the thought of being God's inheritance, just to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Well, there isn't any price too great to pay. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight to this? Yes. This is about what you said earlier concerning not simplifying the truth, but having your eyes be enlightened. Yeah, I waited because I wanted to make sure my thought was clear, but. There's a danger in bringing the truth down because then you end up in a result, you're giving them less than what you would have given yeah. before. Just by means of an example, rich man Lazarus, he's in hell and Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom, so he tells him to send Lazarus down to him and then he would dip his finger <laughs> in water and touch it to his tongue and that because he's tormented by his flame. So, I mean, there's kind of an idea there about people who insist on simplicity it's just like well bring it down and just like give me a drop don't give me a glass don't give me the whole thing just give me a drop yeah. and, I'll, and I'm satisfied with that I mean considering where he was at this wouldn't have helped him a bit no it wouldn't have. and so I mean I can see there that same kind of truth being like when you're in this certain realm when you're not seeing anything that just giving a little bit's not going to help yeah. and you got to get out of that realm yeah. as well as receive a lot you have to get out of the realm so you can yeah here's part we can't sit in judgment on people here, but if a person after a long period of time can't see and it's hard to understand the things associated with redemption, it could be that they're in the wrong place. I don't mean physical place. I mean, not like in the flesh. There could be there where Jesus doesn't teach. There is a realm, realm where Jesus doesn't teach. He just doesn't. You got to get where he is. That's the way it was when he was on earth. You wanted to hear Jesus? You didn't send someone and say, come over to our city and teach us. You had to go where he was. Thank God he isn't confined to one place. In fact, if you really want Christ, he'll make sure he's close enough for you to find him. That wasn't a coincidence that that woman at the well found Jesus sitting there. <laughs> that was arranged right. an arranged meeting. And that's where real evangelism comes in because someone comes to you and they that's ask right. and then you're able to tell. Now in view of this, does it make sense to say, be ready to give an answer? See, that it makes perfect sense now, doesn't it? Be ready to give an answer to every man that asks the reason for the hope. <laughs> for the hope. That's right. <laughs> See? Even sinners can see when someone's living for a different reason. They have a different reason for living. When they ask you, there you are. You can give a reason. Yes, Sister yes. Barbara. He's good. He has his own time. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's yes. right. I can remember years ago uh, in one of my hospitalizations for the lupus, 
praying that night that God would take it away from me. Yeah. And for some reason, he chose not to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he eventually did. That's right. Yeah. You know, Sister Shirley, Daniel said this, and then Jesus said it too, the times are in his hand. That's right. Sometimes he explains it, and sometimes he doesn't. But just knowing... Just knowing that, that the times are in his hand has made you able to negotiate through this, see? Because you know that even though you don't know the details. That's right. He will answer that prayer. That's right. It may not be the way you want it. Well, well ultimately, we're going to get out of this whole thing. Yeah, that's right. You're, that's exactly the truth. Someone else, Sister Barb. I was considering, uh, well, tonight I was reminded of Hezekiah whenever he received the letter. And he laid it before the Lord in supplication and in pleading. In prayer, he laid yeah. this letter before the Lord. And I had that picture of part of the reason Paul wrote this prayer was to lay it before the Lord. Good. In that manner. We, we've talked about before the uh, advantages and the benefits of the, writing out his specific requests had on the recipients. We've also discussed the, the advantages it had for him in, in making and producing that cause. Yeah. But it was also an act of laying it before the Lord. Lord, this is what I'm asking for these brethren, and submitting it to His will also. Amen. Amen. In the world, in this world, men, men's inheritance is something that someone else earned. And in this case, the Lord's inheritance will be what He created. What yeah. He created. So, you know, Amen. We, they, you, we will be giving back. Yes. Uh, what he gave to what us. He gave us. Mm -hmm. it says this is what you gave, and look, it has it's earned ten more. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. And this is very satisfying to the person who's trusting the Lord. Amen. To know that God receives what you gave him. Amen. I was talking to my mother today about that very thing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about some people you've known in your life that nothing ever bad happened to them. They never really went through anything. <laughs> and, and and I was talking to my mom, I said, you know, you realize that if God has a purpose, and he does, in, in eternity already, then the things that come upon you are to tool you or shape you yeah. for that inheritance. Yeah, that's it, that's it. And they're not, they're not, the same thing is when the Holy Spirit comes in, he comes in with a predetermined agenda. <laughs> yeah. He knows what God's going to conform you That's to. Right. He knows. And so he's been empowered to look at the situation and to say, okay, now, Father, I, we know, I know you want this done. This not being done here. We need these things. Because yeah. he, he prays that, according to the will of God. He says God knows the mind of the Spirit. That's right. So he moves <laughs> in in order to, to complete a predetermined agenda. Amen. And so amen. obviously you don't want to grieve that work. Oh, no. Because it won't be accomplished. Then. Yeah, amen. amen. See, if you can see it, salvation is actually a pretty safe thing. If you can get in the right place and live by faith, I mean, no man can pluck you out of his hand. Nothing can, no outside influence can separate you. Not even life. And life, life is too hard for some people. Yes. Or death, or principles, or parts. So you know, there's no there's no adverse influence that can negate what God's done. Amen. Amen. Yeah, well, can't you be an can't you disbelieve? Well, you sure can. That's why I said, vacate there not be an evil heart of unbelief in you. Make sure, make sure, because yes. we got some examples in Scripture. People an evil heart of unbelief entered in the very people that crossed the Red Sea by faith. Yes. Hebrews 11, 7, those very people fell because of unbelief. Hmm? Yeah. Well, if you can believe, mm -hmm. all things are possible. <laughs> all right, we'll have a closing word.